Um, so, um, hello everyone. Uh, sorry for the trouble coming in, um, but um, glad you're all here, uh, safe and well. Um, so, I'm going to start with a little bit about Agile Stationery, just to give you a little bit of context. Um, we are a family business that was started, oh, well, we've been trading a few years now, sort of, it started as a, a hobby business and, and grew and grew in terms of um, the number of products and the amount of interest and the amount of time that we uh, dedicate to it. Um, we started off literally making stationery and uh, for, for the, remember those physical boards that we used to have when we shared physical spaces, we were optimizing those for clarity and legibility and optimizing them as uh, information radiators. And we, um, we got into games such as uh, Estimation Poker and um, grew from there really. So we uh, have a focus on facilitation and enabling collaboration and um, giving people uh, reasons to come together to um, explore problem spaces. And uh, we're big believers in the power of paper um, to create and a big believer in the power of paper games to guide people through complex uh, problem spaces. Um, so we're really happy to be um, working more now with Jeff. Fantastic, thank you, Simon. Um, so yes, Jeff, thank you for, for coming to this uh, workshop. Um, a little bit about you. Um, so Jeff is an enterprise coach with interests in agile project, product management, psychotherapy and business psychology. Uh, he was also the first uh, UK's first certified scrum trainer and helped uh, to co-create organic agility, uh, which is a framework to help organizations um, evolve a more resilient state. Um, he's the author of many books, a few of them to mention, Scrum Product Team and Pun Mastery, uh, as well as Coach's Casebook with Kim Morgan, which uh, focuses on common personality traits uh, that coaches encounter. So um, we're very pleased that Jeff is here to talk about uh, two of his um, uh, exercises, which uh, looks at um, uh, discovering your core values and exploring persuasion techniques. Um, and uh, we welcome Jeff, Jeff to uh, talk us through uh, these techniques that he's created. Uh, so Jeff, welcome and look forward to this session with you. Thank you very much. It's good to be here. <laughs> Excuse my slightly husky voice. I've been slightly out of my comfort zone today and I've been talking a lot more than I've been listening. Normally my day is spent a lot more listening than talking, but <clears throat> I've been talking a lot today. So um, yes, I, I'm sure it'll hold up, but I'm going to, I'm going to go through the, 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 the slightly painful process of, can I share my screen? Can you see my screen? Um, and everything like that. So does that look okay? You, you can see a slide, you see a picture of a dog. Okay, cool. Right then, then that that wasn't too painful. Yeah. So to piggyback onto the onto what Simon was saying, um, I'm I'm also a big fan of collaboration. I'm a big fan of exercises, tools, games, anything that can kind of abstract, supplement, complement, visualize what we're doing, um, and introduce an element of tactile and interactive formats. So as well as, as well as writing, excuse me, like, like, like Davika said, I, I, I'm also spent a lot of time creating different things that, that try and help different people from scrum masters to product owners, to developers, to team leaders, to organizational leaders uh, in various things. Basically, whenever I um, try and have a bit of downtime, my brain runs a little bit wild and I come up with a stupid idea and I ended up turning turn it into some kind of product. So um, I've got all sorts of different physical decks which, I'm, which, which I enjoy playing with and even turn them into digital versions because we're not all as physically co-located as we used to be and would like to be. But I'm, I'm here predominantly to talk to you about <clears throat> two of these physical decks of cards that, that I use with people and give to people to, to try and help them with a couple of pretty common and important but sensitive and potentially even controversial um, aspects of their work, regardless of their role. 
So I'm going to talk to you about core values and how we can go about finding out what our core values are, why it's important to find out what our core values are, both as individuals and team members. And I'm also going to look at um, what I call my persuasion pack, which is a set of influencing techniques based on neuroscience to help you become more influential, to become more persuasive, to be to become a more effective change agent. And <clears throat> maybe maybe this will help you at work, maybe it'll help you outside of work. I don't know. <clears throat> but I think it's these are both two topics that are really important. And I'm, I'm glad that I was invited to talk about both of them together. And I'll say more about that later on, because I think they should be taken in conjunction with one another. <clears throat> My view is that we're all, um, we've all got values. And while I believe that, I think some of us are a lot more conscious, a lot more mindful about what our values are than others. <clears throat> And in my experience, it's the people that are more mindful of what their values are and more mindful about working and living in line with those values that tend to be a lot more effective, um, a lot more fulfilled and uh, a lot more respected by other people. Because as you can see on here, I, I, I'm sure that you could find someone who, who's been accredited with this quote, but I think so many people have been credited with it that it, it's difficult to say who, who originally said this. Regardless, I think it's important. This idea that if you don't stand for something, then you'll fall for anything. And it's, it is quite easy to, um, to be manipulated, sometimes consciously, sometimes unconsciously, by other people, but also by ourselves. It's quite easy to fool ourselves into acting in what we think is a good way or a good direction, but actually isn't in our own strategic best interests. So my, my goal, first of all, is to, is to help people be a lot more clear on what their values are, what they do stand for, so that they can act more coherently, they can act more mindfully uh, and with a lot more integrity. And this, generally speaking, you know, I, I'll, I'll spend a lot of my time, <clears throat> um, I, I split my work in lots of different directions. Uh, I do a little bit of teaching now and again, um, I do some writing, but most of my time is spent coaching, either coaching individuals or leadership teams, usually leadership teams that are, that are trying to, to create a more resilient culture, um, as Devika mentioned. So a lot of my time is spent working one-to-one -one with people, <clears throat> which is where I enjoy, enjoy myself. And a lot, of, a lot of the time, it comes back to values for me. Now, it could just be the lens that I'm looking in or looking through, but we're operating, most of us at least on this call, are probably operating in what, you, what the consultants would call a VUCA world, something that's highly complex, fast-changing, volatile, <clears throat> ambiguous, where... We can't really rely on standardizing best practices. So when we need to figure out what to do, we can't rely on a do this, do this, do this. We can't tell people in this situation, you should do this, you should do this, you should do this. So if we're going to try and create any kind of coherence while enabling and allowing greater autonomy, we need to be relying on values and principles to guide our decision making process on a case by case basis. And in my coaching, um, certainly at the individual level, I do come across a lot of people who are answering yes to a lot of these questions. You know, they are feeling unfulfilled or <clears throat> they're not quite sure why, but they do have a certain level of frustration or resentment with their colleagues or themselves. You know, they, they regret some of the actions they've been taking or the, the action that they haven't been taking. Perhaps they get overwhelmed because they're taking on too much or they're struggling to know what to focus on because they've got so much that they could be focusing on. Everything seems to be important. And they, they'll often complain of being easily taken off track and distracted and feeling dominated by other people. And one of the first things I'll do when coaching these people is to try and get a better understanding of what their values are. Not for my benefit, although 
it is quite interesting, I have to admit. Um, and it can also be quite useful information for our coaching relationship going forward. But it's more important for, for those people that I'm coaching to be able to understand themselves better. And once they do that, they can then use the values that they're more aware of now as sort of guiding principles, if you like, for making these decisions on a contextual basis while they're navigating these complex and ever-changing environments and making really important decisions, not just at a tactical level, but strategic level around their projects, their jobs, their careers, their lives. And it's, it seems quite fundamental, um, but very important and quite sensitive. So this, this deck of values cards <clears throat> that I created, obviously, I mean, I've got 50 in this, in this deck, right? And they've all got a, 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 a picture, a, a cool picture that found lovely colors and everything. And you, with 50, you know, it's quite a lot, but it's still not exhaustive. So you can, there's some blank ones in there where you can create your own. And if we were all in a room together, you know, we might play with all 50, but still that, that's quite a lot. But what I would ask them to do is go through that deck of cards um, one, one at a time and just let that value speak to them. So you and I may look at, for example, community, and that could mean something very different to me or you. I'm not going to describe it. The point of, it, the point of it is not for me to describe what community means. It's trying to, to, to get some resonance with whoever is going through the exercise. And <clears throat> I challenge them. Let's see if I can get this to work. Trying to put a little bit of uh, multimedia into my presentations these days. Um, so it's a difficult exercise. On the face of it, it seems quite important. Uh, sorry, it seems quite easy to just prioritize them. But they will be taking those 50 cards and separating them into a pile of more important to me or less important to me. It seems quite easy, but it's quite difficult because all of those values are potentially positive. And as any of you who've worked in an agile team will find uh, probably quite common, prioritization is not an easy skill. It's not something that we find a lot of people who are highly skilled. It's quite ruthless. You have to be quite ruthless. And once they've done that, they've created two piles. These are more important to me. These are slightly less important to me. They'll be asked them to do it again until maybe even again, and maybe even again until they're down to just six six that are really important to them. Harder than it looks. But once we've got that, <clears throat> we can then, hopefully, um, we can then start using them. Right, we're gonna have a little go at this. Obviously, I don't have all 50 cards on the screen here. That would be uh, impractical. Now, I don't have the opportunity to give you all 50 cards in your hand right now. So I'm going to have to improvise a little bit. We're going to, we're going to try this on a slightly scaled down version. So there are 10 on the screen. Now, I said normally with a group, with a set of 50, I'd ask you to pick six. I'm going to ask you to pick three. Your top three from these 10. Uh, I'm not going to ask anybody to tell me what they are. Okay, you won't have to share this with anybody else, but you've got a couple of minutes to just think about which of these 10 are most important to me, to who I am, to who I want to be. When I'm at my best, this is a part of who I am. These are core values to me. Three, you're only allowed three, a couple of minutes. If I was in any way good with technology, I would be playing some nice little game show music during this little interlude. Or telling you some, some funny little anecdotes just a while away at a time while you're looking at these pictures of a person standing on top of a mountain or hitting a bullseye or one of those strange, weird physical embraces from years gone by when we were allowed to make contact with one another. I'm looking at a little desert island where you could just while away a little bit of peace and quiet, a little bit of me time. 
maybe you're drawn towards the paintbrushes, the creative aspect. Look at me again. We're going to pick just three. Sometimes people like to play them off against each other. They'll put, they'll pair them up and pick a winner that goes through to the next round. Some people like to eliminate the least favorite first. There's no right way. There's no wrong way. As long as you're happy with them yourself. <clears throat> okay, I've got no way of knowing whether any of you are doing this or not. I've not known, see, know whether uh, any of you are doing People are putting them in the chat, people. Yeah. Oh, there's, there's people in the chat, is there? Okay, I should be. I haven't got that. Um, <clears throat> Let me have a quick look at the chat. Okay. I, don't, I don't want to ruin things. I'll break something if I play with it. Okay, so I'm going to assume you've done that. Now, once I've done this with the people that I'm coaching, this could be an individual, this could be a team. I'm going to come back to that in a minute. Once I've done that, I'll ask them to try and solidify that a little bit more. Um, what I mean by that is I'll ask them to think of a, a real example, a real story from recent past, where they've actually illustrated those values in practice. It may well be that they need a separate story for each of their six values. It may well be they've got a couple of stories where they've, they've incorporated all six of them, whatever it is, but they want a couple of stories where they can say, and here is an example of where I put this value into practice. And they'll just repeat that to themselves and They'll capture it. Maybe they'll repeat it to me. So I've got a bit of an insight into them. Um, after that, we might then reflect on, so how well do you think you're living these values right now? How happy are you with the level of inclusion and, and um, sort of walking the talk, if you like, with regards to your values? You are for each of them. And that could be in different circumstances. So for example, if one of my values was uh, creativity, I may feel that actually at work, I'm not being quite creative at the moment. It's relatively low, but outside of work, you know, I'm learning a new musical instrument. I've, I've been dabbling with some, some, new, uh, some new doodling apps on my, on my tablet. Yeah, I, I feel I'm, I'm, used, I'm, I'm living my creative value more outside of work than I am inside of work. So different circumstances, maybe even different projects, maybe even different times of work. Perhaps I'd be living those values differently and it could help to separate that out. So we'll try and create some stories and also do a bit of a, almost a self baseline benchmarking assessment of how well we're doing with them. Just to get you to experience this yourself, because I think this is important. I want you to just think of one story from your recent past, the last couple of months, something that you can really remember, it's still vivid for you, where you've put these values into practice. So you've picked three, maybe you can think of a story where you've got all three. You know, one, one situation where, yeah, I was creative and you know, I helped others and I was challenged. Okay, maybe there's one. If you can, just go through your head the little bullet points of that story. What happened? Who was involved? How did it come about? How did you feel while you were going? What was the situation? How did you get through it? What was the resolution? Just solidify that story in your head as a sort of benchmark of, of when you were at your best, when you're putting those values into practice. If you can't get all three, don't worry, just pick a story where one of them or two of them are involved. And then I want you to give yourself some kind of score out of 10 for how, how much you think you're incorporating or living that value currently. And if it helps, because there is a difference, then split it out. Give yourself a score for in work and out of work, if that helps. If your work is really very varied, and in some circumstances, or some projects or some teams, some of those values are being more incorporated than others, then separate them out as well. 
it's not a case that there's a, a specific formula here. It, it's about trying to find something that's going to be useful for you. <clears throat> I'll just give you 30 seconds or so just to, to do that. Maybe you're doing this in your head. Maybe you're writing it down. Maybe you're doodling it, whatever. But just thinking it through is the most important thing. Once we've, once we've done that, we can then start thinking, how can we be more proactive in this? So we've got a benchmark, we've got a baseline. Maybe we could start looking at how well we're doing going forward. Maybe we start keeping a weekly tally, a daily tally of situations where we've put our values into practice. Maybe we make a a conscious effort to try and put those values into practice more proactively rather than just waiting and see what happens but often just being aware and being more mindful of it means that we do tend to to bring them in a little bit more and that can be enough um, maybe we could look and see if there's any any patterns there why is one value not uh, finding its way into our daily or weekly habits as much as the others does that bother us is there something we'd like to do about that is there something we would like to change about our situation to make that easier for us and make it more um, more likely. <clears throat> and that looks like the same thing. And of course, that's just on an individual basis. So that's me working with one person. But the principle effectively remains the same when we're talking about teams. So every individual has their own core values. But if we're going to work together as a team, it's probably quite useful for us to be aware of what our teammates' values are. Because as well as being able to make sure that we're living our values, we don't want to be doing that at the expense of other people. So again, there are many ways to do this, but the simplest way is just to get everybody to run this exercise individually and look for overlaps, look for patterns, look for common, common values amongst ourselves uh, and see what we can incorporate into our own common team values. Some teams I know will actually select more than six if they're going to look for, for common values to give them greater chance of overlap. Um, I know some teams get really quite um, scientific about it and they'll have sort of tier one values, tier two values, and a tier one value carries twice as many points as a tier two value, and we're looking for the maximum number of points for the team. You can take this however you, have it, however you like. I'm, just, I'm, I'm quite a simple person, really. I try to, try to keep things simple because that's all my brain can handle. But um, for me, it's really important to have um, a set of team values. But I'm wondering whether this is something we could, uh, taking a bit of a gamble here, technology whether this is something we could um we could see what you think what benefits are there to having a set of core values as a team now that is a qr code hopefully oh no will this work will this work are we scanning it jeff should we all do it but yeah you should scan okay. that I'm well, um, my phone <laughs> Still on the screen? I'm in Slido. So, uh, what do you see when you, click, when, you, when, you when you do that code? Oh, uh, what benefits are there to having a core, sorry, a set of core values as a team? Type your answer. Brilliant. So let's see what uh, what people come up with. What benefits are there to having a set of core values as a team? Um, let's see what people come up with. We can create alignment. I'll, I'll read these out to begin with because I, I can't share both screens. Can I share both? No problem. I probably could. If I was clever, I probably could. Togetherness. We can learn more about each other. The team will know what makes people tick. 
understanding what's important to the people you work most closely with, agree a common set of principles, have some shared expectations around behaviours, create a common value system, we can discuss and reflect on values, we can act more as a team, have better collaboration. So I'm just gonna, I'm gonna switch my share so you can see this come through now. Did you want audience members to type in their answer to the question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I think they are. So I'm just going to try and share this one here so you can see them coming through. Um, can you see them? It's very small, but we can see something. Um... Uh, a couple of people, including me, seem to put it into the Q&A section rather than the poll. No worries. No worries. I like it. So I'm, I'm pleased with that for me. I took a bit of a gamble trying to incorporate two bits of technology. So what benefits are there? Yeah, of course, I've seen. So for me, one thing I see very infrequently is actually teams doing this. I don't see teams having that conversation about what do we value individually? What do we value as a team? And because for me, at least, teamwork is such a big thing for organisations that are trying to cope, not just cope, but thrive in a complex environment. It's fundamental to actually getting past a working group, to be at least appreciative and aware, if not actively working towards your teammates' values. I'm going to ask you now if there are any particular questions that would be worth covering before we move on to the persuasion pack. The questions in the Q&A panel are a little more abstract. Okay. Very relevant to that. Anything in the chat? Ah, okay. So they're selecting the values in there. Perfect. Sometimes we confuse values with wishful values. Well, for me, that's an interesting point. I think these values, there's nothing wrong with them being wishful values. I think having, having an ideal view of what we want to be is a, is a good thing. I think it's more dangerous if we're not seeing reality in terms of our application of those values. If we're deluding ourselves that we're acting more in line with our values than we actually are. Um, but that's another benefit of, of being part of a team, is that we can have that conversation, we can share our perspectives, we can uh, feedback to one another on that. Cool. Right, I'm gonna move on to my second pack, and this is the more controversial. Are you ready for a little bit of controversy? Are you all right with this, guys? This is on your channel, right? This is, this is, this is, this is gonna look on you, so. Um, <clears throat> I'm a big believer that we are all politicians. Mm. Now, this usually upsets people. Not the, the fist, although maybe it does. But in fact, the idea that we're all politicians, most people have a sort of guttural reaction to that thought. However, I'd like to ask you, have you ever thought about what to say or how to say it before sending an email? Do you have a CV or a LinkedIn profile? Do you ever put any thought into what clothes you're gonna to wear today? Because if you can answer yes to any of those questions, then I would suggest you are to some degree political. Because you're trying to influence people, not in a bad way, Okay, and this is the thing. We're not here, I'm not here, to tell you to manipulate people. And that's why I said it's really important that we look at these two things together. Because influencing is something that we're all doing every day. We're trying to persuade people all day, 
every day. But if we have a strong set of core values, then we can be confident that we're doing that with integrity. And one of the reasons I don't think we engage with this mindfully is because we have a, at least an unconscious, but for some of us quite a conscious aversion association with politics, whether that's politicians that we are, that we, that we see in the public eye, whether it's the, the national political systems of our country that we're, we're disaffected by, whatever it is, but also we fear crossing the line of manipulation. But when I'm working with, when I'm coaching people in an agile context, from a servant leadership perspective, good servant leaders don't worry about crossing that line. They don't fear, or they don't need to fear crossing that line. I think, just as an example, a scrum master is was defined as a servant leader. I think it's, it's a much bigger part of agile organizational leadership now than, than just scrum masters. I think the principle of, of enabling leadership is much bigger than a scrum master. Um, and, but part of their role is to make change happen. I think part of a product owner's role is to make organizational change happen. I think the biggest part of a traditional leader's role now is to make cultural change happen on a consistent, continual basis. Procedural changes, habitual changes, whatever. Any kind of change takes effort and it takes skill. And I think influence and persuasion are fine. I don't think manipulation is fine. Um, I think one of the, one of the things that, that I like to start with, with people when it comes to talking about influence is bringing up the topic of politics and asking them how they feel about the idea of being a politician, about being involved in organisational politics. And just basically teasing out from them what they associate with the words. I think there's a more helpful and more positive and more constructive definition of organisational politics. Uh, something that, that we actually need to be more mindful and conscious of in order to make change happen and not just happen, but happen quickly. So looking at the greater good of the company, and which is, again, at the risk of repeating myself, really, really important to know what our values are, to know what we stand for, so we know where that line is. I think almost all of you in this webinar today will have the need at some point to persuade somebody to back an idea of yours or you will want to or need to change someone's mind about something or you'll want to make something different happen or perhaps you're trying to make something happen and you're trying to understand why people just aren't coming along with you it's absolutely not it's a no-brainer why would anybody in their right mind resist this idea it's brilliant but you're still getting resistance if you want to understand why that is, we need to understand how people make decisions, why people make decisions, how people are influenced, how people change their minds, why people change their minds. Or maybe you're just one of those people that is fed up with other people seeming to know how to push your buttons and get you to do what they want. And you want to understand how they understand your mind better than perhaps you do. So I put together a, a, a a number of techniques and tools based on neuroscience um, that have been shown to increase the effectiveness of our ability to change people's minds, to influence people, to persuade people, but also to stop ourselves from being very easily manipulated. I'm trusting you to use this knowledge with integrity. As Spider-Man's Nan said, with great power comes great responsibility. <laughs> Is it? I don't know. Someone in the Spider-Man film said that. So I want you to have a think about someone you'd like to influence. All right. And I'm going to talk through a few of these cards, a few of these techniques. And maybe some of them you think, Do you know what? Yeah, that could be useful to me. 
And I don't think, bearing in mind my values, my integrity, I don't think that's manipulation. I think that's for the benefit of the organisation, for the benefit of all actors, I think that would help. Okay. So the first one is called guess their thoughts. Effectively, these are patterns, right? And, and if I can if I can empathize with the person that I'm trying to convince, if I'm trying to influence, trying to persuade, and I can, if I can show them that I understand why they might be concerned or wary or worried or anxious about the idea that I have in mind, it shows that I care about them. It shows that I'm on their wavelength. It shows that I'm not just trying to whitewash them and then bamboozle them. Okay, I've considered their perspective. And it also gives them some confidence that I'm taking into account risks. And that, all of that stuff, increases their opinion of you, which in turn increases their opinion of your idea. Now, they're still free to reject it, but it gives them a more rounded, more positive view of the situation. Okay, now once you've heard their concerns and you've shown that you've empathised with their concerns, it's quite important that you don't just fob them off as uh, petty or, or, or pointless or silly, all right? Um, but if we've, got a, if we've got some empathy with them and we've got a plan for how to tackle them, things might become a little bit easier. So that's one, guess their thoughts. The second one, identity alignment. Now, what this means is basically tying your idea to what they value, the kind of person they would like to be, what we know about them as a person. So coming back to our core values again, if I know that someone is really, really attached to the value of quality and my idea has the potential to raise quality, then I can just make that more visible, more transparent. Again, you have to make the decision as to whether that's influence is okay or not. But helping them see what's useful, helping them see what's beneficial, uh, and helping them get more benefit from your idea, it's a good thing. Um, being able to empathize with the difficult situation they're in, being able to empathize with the fact that this is a difficult choice, it's a difficult thing for them to change their mind or go along with this new way of working or go along with your new idea, you can empathize with that, but you can offer them a values-based way out or a values-based way of changing their mind. So that's the second one. The third one, social proof. Um, so this is uh, basically saying, uh, and you'll have come across something like this. So um, if you can remember, the, uh, this is probably not a good example anymore, but down the bottom there, it says hotel users used to put on your hotel rooms, 85% of people in this, uh, you know, in this hotel reuse their towels. Uh, so you, you know, it's, it's a good thing if you want, you want to be part of the normal crowd, right? You don't want to be one of those idiots or um, bad people who don't reuse their towels. 80% uh, of people in this room reuse their towels. So you have this sense of social proof. When you walk past the restaurant and you see people in the window come May 17th, um, it's a sign that other people think this is a good thing. So it's, it's less of a risk for me to join in. So provide some element of social proof, makes it more attractive, makes it less risky. I'm not talking about manufacturing social proof here. I'm talking about actually gathering some data that makes it more comfortable, some real data. The next one, the white coat syndrome. Uh, so I'm, I'm generally met with two responses when I'm, um, when I'm speaking to people in an organization for the first time. The first response is, Jeff, you know nothing about what goes on in our organization. You don't know anything about us as a business. I'm not gonna to listen to you. You're just talking about generic textbook stuff or you're talking about other organizations, their situation is nothing like ours, I'm not gonna to listen to you. They only value people from their tribe's opinions. The other reaction I get is, Jeff, you just said exactly what we've been saying, but they're listening to you because you're an outsider. 
Now, both of those are examples of the white coat syndrome, but for different people. Because the white coat syndrome does come from the idea of the medical white coat, people trust doctors, they've studied, and they should really, right, because they've studied for a long time, they generally got good, good, uh, um, good backing and good knowledge and good intelligence and, and Hippocratic Oath and all that kind of stuff. But they have some authority, not formal authority necessarily, but informal authority. So finding out whose opinion these people respect and seeing whether they have anything to say about your idea. That could be helpful. Sometimes it's not what you say, it's who's saying it. So thinking about that, um, if I had more time, I'd tell you about some really interesting studies about people just dressing up in uh, uniforms and going around parks and telling people what to do. People just listen to people in any kind of uniform, doesn't matter what the uniform is. Um, now, if you notice in the, in the top right hand corner here, there's a picture of a cat, but the background is red. So I've color coded these cards in terms of either difficulty or risk. So this is one of the, the riskier or more difficult ones. It's called peaking superstition. Now, I've always been brought up that it's bad luck to be superstitious, um, but I do know a lot of people uh, that are superstitious and how and, and, and actually let superstitions influence their beliefs. Uh, this is one of those risky ones because this is quite this is quite close to um, to the line for many people. But we could make use of people's superstitions to help them. Um, to help them make a more beneficial decision for them if they are influenced by superstitions. Um, and I said down the bottom there, when you couple that with the principle of identity alignment, uh, maybe, maybe it become even more powerful. So is there something to do with patterns? We tend to see patterns, we tend to see clusters, we tend to draw connections when there aren't any. We want to explain the unexplainable. And sometimes a superstition is an easy way to do that. Cool. So those are, those are your five. Um, and I want you to think about someone you'd like to influence. And I want you to pick one of those cards and think, how could I use this pattern to help me be more influential with that person while fitting with my values? Again, I'm not going to ask anybody to read theirs out, but if anybody does want to share in the chat, you're more than welcome. It's still 30 to 60 seconds while I have a quick look through the chat window. And the Q&A window. Um, I also wanted to uh, to try this one, and that would require me to. Ooh, ooh. So it's the same code, but now I'm going to push myself even further and see if I can open the second poll. So if you go back to that same um, Slido, the question now should be: What are the benefits to the organisation, not just to you as an individual? if you were to become more influential and persuasive? What benefits could there be if you were to become more influential and persuasive? Let's see what we come up with. First of all, can anybody confirm that they can see that question? Brilliant. So benefits are starting to come in, seeing faster decisions, more collaboration, better leadership, more likely to do the right thing, because I know what that is. A better culture, happier staff, better products, happier customers, more engaged people, more value, more visibility, more alignment, work would get done quicker, more propensity for experimentation and learning, more cohesiveness, easier to be heard, lots lots of benefits if you were to become influential and persuasive and again these aren't just selfish benefits these are benefits to the organization if you were to become more influential and persuasive assuming i was doing it in a productive way i'd like to think we would see higher performing teams 
And yes, we can influence the situation, we can influence people in a more ethical way. Good. Thank you. Let's go back to this one. And I'm going to open up to questions. So, how do you want to do this, Simon, the deacon? Um, well, I was going to say, we've got some interesting questions on Q&A, actually. Um, so, um, shall we try some of those questions? And there were some questions posted on the um, core values as well. Um, so, anonymous attendee, when do you come back when, uh, to the team values? Is this something you do every retro, once a quarter? What do you suggest, recommend? Um, I personally, my, my default response to any of these types of questions is I ask the team. Um, so I would ask the team when they would like to come back to them. For me, if I'm if I'm in the role of coach for that team, they would always be quite visible. Um, so I've actually got a sticky note here of, of the six values of one of the teams that I'm coaching at the moment, just as a bit of a reminder for me. So that when I'm when I'm in a session, when I'm when I'm just observing, when I'm seeing things, perhaps I'm seeing Slack messages pop up or emails pop up or something, I I have them to hand so that I can maybe even push back to the team or even highlight to the team. So just looking at your values, is anything going on here? How are we doing with that? Um, this is coming across to me as something a bit conflicting. Is it coming across to you as that? But yeah, we could have a very focused session on these things because they can change. They can change as the team matures or the team composition changes. And so having that, that regular check-in, maybe, maybe every month, every couple of weeks might be too, um, too frequent. But equally, I've seen teams pick one value and use that as a theme for a retrospective. Mm. For example, creativity, they'll use that as a theme for a retrospective, or they'll have it as part of their um, sort of monthly theme, as well as their sprint goal. Uh, they might have creativity as their, as their focus or challenge as their focus. That's how are we going to incorporate more of this particular value uh, over, this, over this period of time? Um, there was a... Go on, oh no, I was going to no, ca actually carry on because, uh, well, all right, I've interrupted now, I suppose, but um, it's just interesting you mentioned team values and then, because um, when I think about team values, then one is you can, you can aspire to have team values and you can pick, but as you said earlier, we pick creativity uh, as a team value. And one is you can derive the team values by looking at individual values and then aggregating that information somehow and finding out what the common values are and this is what your team is, is made of. So when you refer to team values, are you, and when you um, talk about doing this exercise uh, at, at a team level, uh, do, do you mean pick your team values or do you mean go and do this exercise individually and then we will derive our team values? So this, this, using this deck of cards is one way that I've used, the one way that I've helped teams come up with their team values. The exercise that I described here. There are many other ways of helping a team come up with their core values. The, 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 the point is having something that works. Quite often a team have got something already uh, and we can just reflect on them, whether we want to inspect and adapt them. But let's just run with that, that as an example, right? So, so we'll run this, this core values exercise with each individual we'll get the individuals to share those values amongst themselves. And then using that as a starting point, what could we come up with? It could be that we list them. For example, I've seen teams then cluster them and say, do you know what, achievement's quite close to this one. So yeah, achievement and challenge, they're kind of the same area for us as we interpret them. So if we group them together, what different label would we give that one? And, and they, they will do it that way. That's it's good, all right? And it, well, it's more than good, it's very good, but it's still quite abstract. So personally, when I'm working with a team, I will also challenge them to say, as well as the stories, you know, think of some examples of where you as a team have actually lived these values. Think of some examples of stories that you could create over the next couple of months that would show you are living these values. I'd also be looking for specific commitments that each member of the team would be comfortable signing up to, that would, you could see, you could see visible examples of that, um, that, would, that would be um, 
examples of them actually living those values. So if we picked um, creativity, for example, so it will give me an example of what creativity might look like as a team that all of you as individuals, as members of this team would be happy to commit to. And I'll come up with some different examples. Maybe they say, um, okay, well, um, in sprint planning, we'll always do um, a, a drawing of our potential solution before we start. Or someone else might say, um, okay, well, before we make any decision, we'll always come up with at least five options. That's creative. Um, someone might say, okay, well, we're always gonna wear uh, different hats in our planning session, so we always think from different perspectives. Wh whatever it may be, they'll come up with some different options, but they're more concrete, they're more specific that they say, yeah, I'm happy to commit to that for a sprint. I'm happy to commit to that for a sprint. Then we've got it. And then we can start looking at what well, did that help? Do we now feel like we're fulfilling this value or living this value a lot more as a team? And even more importantly, is that helping us? Okay, interesting. Great, thanks, Jeff. Uh, should we move on to some other questions? Simon, do you want to take the next one? Uh, there was a, a, a short follow-up that um, I'm a little conscious of time. But there's a short follow-up um, from Sharon who asked, "What's the relationship between the core values and the um, the team charter? Is it different from that, or is it done on top of that?" And then I'd like to take the question from Max, which goes into whether you're working in the team or the organisation. Cool. No worries. So, uh, so Sharon's question is: This different to the team charter on top of the team charter? I would consider this a part of a team charter, um, though. So, and, and team charter means different things to different people. But when I think of a team charter, I think of like a, um, a number of different components that define us as a team. So it could be a name, it could be a motto, it could be a logo, it could be values and principles and behaviours and commitments and all different aspects, whereas this is just, just one part of it. I think it's probably the most important part of it. I think it's more important than having a team name. I think it's more important than having a team logo, although I do think those things are important. I think it's more important having a team motto, uh, but it's it's just part of that definition of a team. But I think it should be the, the fundamental core of that team charter. And which, where did you want to go next? Yeah. So uh, Max Bicknell asked a question. Hi, Max. Uh, I, I know Max, but, uh, but, but I, I didn't spot that before reading this question. Uh, sorry, I didn't spot his name before, before finding the question. Um, change within a team feels like uh, a much more safe space for a coach to play. And more often uh, than not, the agenda for that change is already there. At the org level, this is much harder. What different techniques do you apply when creating an agenda for an organizational or cultural changes? So essentially, this is one of those famous things where I say it's exactly the same, but very different. Um, because in principle, it's the same, all right? So what we're looking for, generally, when I'm working with an organization to help transition their culture to something more conducive to at least survive, if not thrive within this kind of VUCA world, the balance that we're trying to strike at the organizational level is greater autonomy without chaos, all right? We still want coherence, but we also need autonomy. We, we, we can't wait for everything to be escalated up and then back down again. And even if we could, the expertise probably isn't the top anymore. It's probably at the coalface. So we need to enable those people who have the skills and the knowledge and are actually encountering the problems to be able to make educated decisions, but in a strategic way. So although team A may be facing very different problems, very different challenges on a very different piece of work to team B, so they're going to be making contextually very, very different decisions because they're facing different situations. They should be making those decisions with common values and common principles underpinning them. So this, the, and that's exactly the same as within one team, although just on a much smaller scale. So even in a small team of seven, right, a self-organizing scrum team, for example, each individual may be making decisions on a daily or hourly basis. They don't need to get consensus and go through planning poker and then, you know, does everybody, we need majority on it. No, no, I'm, I'm, I have authority to make decisions at an individual level to, to a degree. But I want to make sure that I'm not undermining other people. I'm not contradicting those people. I'm not causing tension by going off in completely different directions, which is where these common values come in. 
So I can make decisions, I can have autonomy, but we have the consistency at the values level. Right? And those values are not just around things like honesty or trust. They're around experimentation when there isn't a right answer, for example, or um, you know, minimizing, making, making um, learning, learning information as quickly and cheaply as possible. That could be a value, for example. Um, and having that conversation at an organizational level provides that level of cohesiveness, provides that level of consistency that allows contextual decisions to be made without slowing things down. Now that made perfect sense in my head, but did it make sense when it came out my mouth? I think so. <laughs> we were just discussing offline, to be honest with you, whether to take one more question. Um, and we had picked out the question from Colin, if you have time, uh, Jeff. Yep. Okay. What do you recommend if you discover team members have radically different values? Mm -hmm. Um, so again, I'll, I'll, I'll start with my, my default of uh, it's not really my place to, to decide what to do with that information, but I would play that back. Um, so what I will tell you is I've seen different responses to that, different successful responses and different unsuccessful responses. So I've seen successful responses where that team has stayed together and they've worked through those differences of values and they've used a common third value, for example, around respect or something like that, to, to work out ways where we can, can work cohesively without, um, without sabotaging each other. I've also seen successful outcomes where the team decides, you know what, it would probably be better if we worked in different teams. Not because I don't like you, but actually, just our, the, the differences that we've got, while differences does bring diversity and, and, and usefulness, sometimes we can be too different and it takes too long to us, for us to actually work together. So let's, let's just agree to part ways now rather than try and force ourselves to work through a really tense um, process of working together. Both of those have been quite successful. The unsuccessful situations have been where that difference has been glossed over. So we try, that's, that's an awkward conversation. Mm, let's not have it. Let's pretend we didn't see that. Or let's rationalize it in a different way without actually dealing with it. It's, it can be difficult. It can be something that we need uh, some help with sometimes. It needs to be dealt with delicately and tactfully sometimes but equally with a fair amount of adult level respect that we are all good people. We all want a positive outcome. Um, and we just are different human beings. No one is meaning anything bad by this. Would you suggest these are used in interviews, Jeff, at the point of hiring? Or is that too Anyone much? Using them in interviews is that interviews are often a game. So they're not really a safe space because we have, we have something quite substantial to lose. Either I risk hiring somebody that turns out to be a bad hire, or I risk losing a job that I really, really want or need. So if, if it felt safe, brilliant. I think it's a great way um, I mean, this is a really, I suppose it could be seen as quite a negative way of looking at it, but failing fast. Now, I'd rather find out that my values don't match the organization's values and vice versa before we make any kind of commitment, because undoing something is a lot more painful and complicated than, than not. So in principle, yes, but in practice, I find it too much of a game. That makes sense. Okay. Well, we are definitely over time and um, sure. I'm sure um, uh, uh, people have questions and I think we, we may have to miss a, a couple of questions, but people are dropping off the call. They have other uh, um, engagements and, and, and things to attend. But uh, Jeff, can I say this was a very, um, very interesting session. Thank you for sharing these two exercises. 
uh, both using you know, physical resources, which we value a lot. Um, so yes, thank you for presenting these to us. And thanks to all the attendees for, for joining. Um, we had quite a good turnout at the end um, and some great questions. Um, and don't forget to uh, give us your feedback. This is to all the attendees uh, and then enter our prize draw to, to actually win one of Jeff's uh, card decks. Uh, How do they do that, David? Oh, well, I, I, I actually put a link in the, in the chat group before uh, I saw people were dropping off as we went a little bit over time. Okay. Um, so yes, there's a link, um, but if you don't see it, just just uh, get in touch with me. Uh, that's absolutely fine uh, on Meetup or Eventbrite. Or... Time to have 5.58. Yeah, but thank you again, Jeff. And uh, yes, I'll be trying these out this week, as I said earlier, uh, and I will be sharing my findings soon. <laughs> Brilliant, thanks for having me. Thanks thank you. Great. <laughs> Bye. Thanks very much. Bye.